Perfect. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, maybe we can just, uh, well, I'll do a bit of an introduction for myself as well, and then we'll hop into to the, the slides. Um, as Elsie mentioned, I'm Saul Joseph. I'm a member of the Squamish First Nation. Uh, my dad's Chief Floyd Joseph, a hereditary chief uh, here in Squamish. I also have familiar ties to Snanaymouth uh, in what is now Nanaimo. And on my mom's side, uh, I'm non-Indigenous, mainly European ancestry. Um, I'm a partner with Clark Wilson. Uh, we're a regional firm based out of Vancouver here. Uh, we're quite large for our market. We've got 100 plus lawyers. I think we're up to about 110 lawyers or something. Um, and we practice in almost all areas. Um, and, you know, our, uh, our Indigenous law group is one that's been around for, I think, about six or seven years now. Um, it's growing quickly. Uh, we've been able to do all sorts of really cool things, including some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so my sort of thought for the chat, acknowledging that this is smack dab in the middle of everybody's afternoon, is I was just hoping to, to go through a short presentation, uh, maybe 20 minutes or something, and just really open it up for questions and if we can have a, a bit of a discussion, um, particularly as uh, there might be people from other jurisdictions uh, on the line and uh, BC is an interesting sort of case study and what's happening with respect to the implementation of UNDRIP uh, and what we might be able to expect from the federal government going forward. So that was my thought. Um, and maybe uh, we can just go to the next slide. <clears throat> so in BC, there's two pieces of relatively recent legislation uh, that we've been able to, to get our hands on and start working with. Uh, one of which is the BC Environmental Assessment Act. Uh, which, as you imagine, is the, the piece of legislation that's responsible for provincial assessments, environmental assessments in the province. And the other is the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, or DRIPA, as I'll be referring to it. Uh, and DRIPA is the, the piece of provincial legislation that actually implements UNDRIP. Um, so as we all know, uh, UNDRIP itself was developed over a number of decades. Uh, it's an international declaration. Uh, it didn't necessarily have application in Canadian law for a very long time. Um, and even when it was passed, Canada didn't formally uh, sign on to it. It didn't give its express approval. Ultimately, uh, it did approve it with some reservations in 2015 or something, uh, maybe 2010. And then as of now, uh, it's fully signed on to UNDRIP. And BC was the first jurisdiction in Canada to actually import UNDRIP into domestic law. Um, and we now have a federal piece of uh, legislation as well, which is lagging uh, a little bit in terms of uh, on the ground actions. And so BC is, uh, I think, a, a good, maybe not high watermark, but a good indicator of where the federal government may be going. Uh, next slide. So BCEA, the Environmental Assessment Act, was passed in 2018. Um, DRIPA itself wasn't actually passed until 2019. Um, so they were coming up relatively alongside one another. The discussions around both uh, were cognizant of you know, what legislation is going to have to look like. Uh, there was consultation uh, with respect to how UNDRIP would be implemented or how UNDRIP would be referenced in BCEA 2018. Um, so it was contemplating and relatively aware of what DRIPA was ultimately going to look like and what some of the steps that uh, DRIPA uh, would utilize would be. Um, so despite being passed before DRIPA, uh, BCEA 2018 is, a, to my mind, a relatively good approximation of what legislation is going to look like um, post-DRIPA. Um, and I'll sort of talk about that. Uh, in a little bit in the next section. Um, so some of the, the concrete things that we see in this act uh, are in the purposes. So explicitly, um, BCEA is referencing reconciliation, and then it gives concrete steps about how it will actually carry out reconciliation within the context of environmental assessments. Um, so one of those steps, one of those tools is implementing UNDRIP. Um, 
recognizing inherent jurisdiction and rights, including the right to participate in decision-making processes where uh, Section 35 rights may be impacted, uh, collaboration um, on effectively any part, uh, be it uh, a portion of or the entirety of an environmental assessment with nations, um, which is uh, really, really powerful language there's still a lot of room for interpretation. And as I'll sort of talk about with our quad health case study, the province somewhat predictably, I think has a bit of a different interpretation of pieces of the act as compared to nations. Um, so there's still a lot of room for development. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that have yet to be enacted. For example, the capacity funding regulation, the dispute uh, uh, resolution regulation, still don't exist. So there's some pretty core components of the act that nations need certainty on that do not exist, that the EAO is still somewhat hesitant to go out on a limb for and is still relatively conservative in how it approaches it. Um, and similarly, what supporting the implementation of UNDRIP actually means. Um, you know, there's room for interpretation with the inclusion of supporting. Nobody really knows what that means. Um, and so it's left to nations to effectively engage in those conversations, as well as proponents and others, um, but primarily nations in, in this context. Uh, to, to push the, the government, to push the EAO to figure out what that means and to start to build up some more meaningful definitions and build up some precedent language and have some uh, example agreements out there that other nations and industry and others can, can look at and start to understand what is the scope of supporting UNDRIP, for example, or what does reconciliation look like in the context of an environmental assessment. Um, so, uh, sorry, just go back for one sec. Just at the bottom of this slide, section 41 um, sets out the explicit right for the EAO to enter into agreements with nations uh, for any part of an assessment or the entirety of an assessment. Uh, and so that's the, the type of agreement that we're gonna be talking about next. So you can go to the next slide. So the language we've been using, we've done two of these now, or we've completed one and are about to finish the second is collaboration agreements. But I think there's, it's probably pretty open in terms of what these are actually called. The act doesn't prescribe anything and it's kind of up to the, to the nation and the EAO just to settle upon you know, how they want to phrase or how they want to name these types of agreements. Um, but it's a really strong and flexible tool that's available to nations. Um, that serves a number of purposes. Um, as we know, nations are stewards of their territories, their lands and resources, um, and are thinking in a, a cumulative way, are thinking seven generations out, uh, and are not necessarily approaching each environmental assessment on a case-by-case -case basis. They're thinking in the broader context, what's happened before, uh, what are uh, the cultural, spiritual, economic, other interests on the land over and above just those that might be strictly captured by an environmental assessment if the nation wasn't involved. Uh, and so to be able to formalize a process around all of these other variables and to build out better and more comprehensive definitions like around reconciliation, around supporting the implementation of UNDRIP, around the, the, the pieces of the act that really need interpretation and need to be grappled with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so some of what can and has been negotiated in these types of agreements are consensus seeking. How are the parties actually gonna work together and make decisions together? Um, as we know, uh, you know, Provincially and federally, environmental assessments have been a top-down administrative process in the past. Uh, in this context, the province still is the final decision maker, um, but there's a lot more process built throughout that involves nations throughout the decision-making process at all stages, um, that it, it alleviates some of that uh, pressure at the final decision stage ultimately resulting in a lot more legal certainty for the nation, for the proponent, and for the province. Um, so consensus seeking, what does that actually mean? We hear, we hear talked about a lot in the context of UNDRIP and how the parties are meant to work together. 
Uh, this is a really great area for bringing in indigenous legal orders and indigenous legal principles about how decisions should be made. Um, and so that's a really nice opportunity for reviving, you know, traditional governance systems and bringing in ways that nations historically and continue to do so uh, working with uh, within themselves and with other nations. Um, and our experience so far with the EAO has uh, been that they're, they're open to those discussions and keen to learn. Um, so that's been a powerful tool in terms of just building a bit of certainty about how decisions are going to be made throughout the process, tracking whether consensus was reached, whether it wasn't reached, what steps were taken, um, and the ultimate resolution. So all of that information goes to the final decision maker and all has to be considered uh, by the province before any project is actually approved and has to be reflected in reasons. So building up a, a lot more sort of procedural safeguards for the nation and again, leading towards legal certainty for all of the parties. Um, assessment of uh, Section 35 rights. Uh, so the Act explicitly sets out that nations are able to take on the assessment of their own rights and the impacts to those rights. Um, so in the past, previously, what was seen was effectively the Crown would come to the nation with a preliminary depth of uh, consultation report would talk about the scope of the, the, the nation's Section 35 rights. Um, typically, just from a desktop review or from publicly available information that the Crown has, um, and then making an initial assessment about the, the scope of adverse impacts to those rights. This relates to the process that would have been afforded to the, the nation in terms of consultation, funding, um, and potential outcomes. So by delegating this or recognizing the nation's inherent jurisdiction to carry out these assessments, um, it, it starts the process in a much better way and in a much more appropriate way in terms of assessments of what's actually happening in terms of nation rights. Um, consent, uh, again, this is a flexible concept that requires interpretation and has to be responsive to a case-by-case -case basis or the facts on each case-by-case -case basis. Um, so again, ultimately, uh, this is not the sort of veto that we've heard about because there still is a provincial decision maker at the end of the process regardless. So what happens when a nation chooses to withhold consent, its final consent decision, is still somewhat unclear. Um, I'll talk about what we did with Foggill uh, in a second, but... I think for now, uh, how we need to be thinking about consent is that it's flexible. It's going to look different in each circumstance, and that's completely fine. Um, but it's something that's going to have to be grappled with each and every single time. So it's not something to be uh, dismissed, um, but something to be, I think, addressed uh, on the facts of each, each specific circumstance. Reconciliation, again, we sort of talked about, you know, the it's possible to, to figure out a definition of what reconciliation or, or how the Crown will contribute to reconciliation through an environmental assessment process. Uh, dispute resolution, uh, this is another really great area for bringing in Indigenous legal orders. Uh, it's possible for the nation to appoint its own uh, dispute resolution. What would you call it? Dispute. <laughs> individuals to decide the dispute. I'm not exactly sure what the, the word for that would be. Um, so you can bring in elders, you can bring in others with traditional knowledge to inform disputes and, and uh, figure out resolution in a culturally appropriate manner. And the EAO has shown themselves to be open and responsive to that. Indigenous legal orders we talked about generally inherent jurisdiction that's explicitly set out in the purposes of the act. And there's a lot of opportunities for getting the Crown to formally agree to recognize nation's inherent jurisdiction. So moving away from rights denial, rights minimization, rights avoidance to rights recognition, getting that on paper from the outset, and again, starting those processes in a good way. Um, with respect to uh, how the process will be carried out and consensus seeking the collaborative assessment procedures, so it's kind of building on that consensus seeking, what are the actual steps? What's the calendar? What's required from who? Who has what obligation, et cetera? The procedural stuff. Um, the EAO has also shown themselves open to, to making certain requirements of proponents. 
uh, and having those discussions around uh, engagement requirements early uh, and taking a bit more of a proactive role, again, leading towards that legal certainty um, and just aligning all of the parties and ultimately resulting in better decisions. So there's a, a broad, broad, broad category of items that can be included in these types of agreements. Um, recently, we finalized one for Claw Guild on the northern part of Vancouver Island, just uh, outside of Port Hardy. That included all of the above, and that's a publicly available agreement in respect of the Black Bear Project. Um, so you can find that on the, it's called EPIC, the BCEAO website. And it was a really interesting process. So that was a project specific agreement in relation to a, a gravel pit, an existing gravel pit expansion project. It's a significant expansion, uh, will extend the life of the project uh, exponentially. Uh, there'll be a lot more activity on the territory. Um, so there's a number of factors that uh, the nation had to be considering, including the private economic relationship with the proponent. Uh, the government to government relationship that was addressed primarily through this collaboration agreement, um, all of the stewardship aspects, uh, and then uh, you know, all the, I guess all the other stuff that's typically in an IBA, the employment contracting, um, as well as land ownership and other relationships with the Crown, which are ongoing as well, that are outside of this collaboration agreement. Um, so ultimately, it took it took a fair amount of time, uh, probably took close to a year to actually draft and finalize the agreement. Uh, but there was a few things that we were really happy with. Uh, we were able to put meat on the bones of what we thought reconciliation in this particular concept or in this particular um, circumstance actually looked like. So we, we landed on a, a definition of reconciliation that we were pretty happy with. Um, with respect to ensuring that there was process around consent and a meaningful understanding of what consent and impacts in the event that the nation decided to withhold its consent. Uh, there's dispute resolution up until uh, that final consent decision. And even if the nation withholds its consent, then there's still process required from the minister to, to go back to the nation to see if there's a way forward that the nation's concerns can be addressed in advance of any decision being made and then ultimately the parties coming together. Um, so in terms of just protecting the nation, protecting the process, uh, we, we put safeguards in place around consent and making sure that there's a lot of discussion, particularly if the nation chooses to withhold its consent up to and uh, including that final consent decision right before the referral package goes to uh, cabinet for consideration. Indigenous legal orders in that Paul Gilf context, um, Typically, EAs will have a technical advisory committee, sometimes a community advisory committee. In this instance, we also created effectively an Indigenous Legal Order Advisory Committee. Uh, so we have about five um, knowledge keepers from community who are engaged from the very first step of the process. They review all of the documents. They're engaged if a dispute arises. Um, and in terms of assessing documents as they come in, the, the, the role there is really just to, to infuse the process with cooperative protocol to be able to bring in traditional legal knowledge, cultural knowledge, uh, socioeconomic uh, community information to, to be able to be uh, on the fly responsive to information that's brought into the process. Um, and in a way that, we as lawyers or other uh, environmental consultants simply can't respond to. So it's an invaluable part of the process that we're really happy with and proud about. Um, and it's just one of those uh, you know, flexibilities that we were able to take advantage of in this process. Um, and as mentioned, this was a project specific agreement. Why it was so important in this context uh, was because there's thresholds set out in BCEA to determine whether it's a, a full project, which requires the, the full suite uh, of um, process set out in BCEA 2018. Anything that falls below that, it's a little bit uncertain. So it's still part of the gap um, in terms of the regulation of BCEA 2018 that isn't exactly set out yet. So due to the scope of the, this project, 
EAO determined that we were gonna be a complex amendment, but where that left us in terms of process, just on a strict read of the act was a bit uncertain. Um, oops, sorry, let's just see another. Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll get the link out to, to the, um, um, the agreement out uh, whenever I can. Um, so to give the nation, the proponent and the crown certainty, in this instance, it was really important to actually enter into this specific agreement. Effectively, what the result is, is we cherry picked all the pieces of the full um, assessment that we wanted that were beneficial to the nation and imported those. Um, and it ended up being effectively a full environmental assessment. Um, despite us not necessarily having met the thresholds in under the act or having to go through the process of having uh, it determined that it is through section 11. Um, lastly on these uh, the other agreement that we're about to, to finalize the other collaboration agreement is a non-project specific so that's a, a territorial based agreement uh, where the nation and the eao have been negotiating all of these same components uh, but not on a project by project basis, just on a general basis, saying that these are the minimum um, uh, things, the minimum um, characteristics that have to be assessed in every single instance within the entire territory of that nation. Um, and then as projects arise, then uh, subsequent agreements can be set out with respect to the specific procedures. Um, but it's the overarching framework for how environmental assessments will be carried out in the territory. Um, so this is a really great tool in terms of that legal certainty piece uh, and in terms of generating leverage for nations. We've gone through all sorts of different processes, tried all sorts of different things. Something that came to mind just before the, the call was we used to prepare consultation guidelines for nations frequently, particularly Alberta sort of east. In a lot of the prior provinces, we were effectively just trying to get proponents to, to get provincial governments to take uh, nations' rights and interests seriously and, and meaningfully engage in this process, this shared decision making process, to mix results. Ultimately, uh, you know, I think it was probably a bit of a frustrating process. Some people engaged meaningfully, others didn't. Um, but this is a much stronger way of effectively doing that same thing of just like planting a uh, a flag in, in the ground and saying this is how assessments are carried out uh, in the nation's territories and the nation and the province are, are in agreement about what those processes look like including consensus seeking including consent including reconciliation including uh, engagement and obligations on the proponent so in terms of generating leverage with uh, proponents who are looking to, to operate in the nation's territory it's a really strong statement and it, it provides the nation with a lot of process and a lot of legal resource recourse to, to be able to make sure that they're uh, having the meaningful say in anything that goes on in the territory. Go to the next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, BCEAA was passed and enacted prior to DRIPA, um, but because the discussions were going on at the same time, there is some indirect uh, recognition of uh, one of the other tools of, of DRIPA. So section seven of BCEA 2018 says that a project may not proceed without consent where there's, a, or may not proceed where there's a consent agreement in place between the Crown and a nation uh, and the nation does not provide its consent. So this is a very, 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 very powerful tool. Uh, I think, you know, a step over and above collaboration agreements like we were just talking about. Uh, they can cover a lot of the same ground, but what or where the collaboration agreements, you know, you can build up process around what consensus seeking looks like, around what consent looks like, have dispute resolution, have meetings between the parties, but ultimately that the Crown is the final decision maker. What, it, what this says is that where the nation has entered into a consent-based agreement, the project can't proceed. Uh, so this has yet to be tested. Uh, and there's, there's still some questions to be answered around that, uh, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more right now. So maybe we'll just go to the next slide. Uh, so trip up. 
our provincial legislation that implements UNDRIP. There's a number of mechanisms for how UNDRIP is gonna be implemented in the province. Uh, the first is alignment of provincial laws. So section three says that all provincial laws will be uh, amended to be consistent with UNDRIP. Um, how the province is interpreting this uh, is still relatively new. Uh, we have a, a DRIPA secretariat now. It's a, a recently enacted um, Ministry of Government specifically designed specifically with the purpose of figuring out these questions of how to implement UNDRIP. They recently released their interim guidance on, um, on legislative amendments. There are some really good things in there, um, including a lot of consultation, which has been a question for nations for a very long time, which up until now was effectively answered by Nikisu that said that there is no duty to consult when pre pre preparing legislation. It was only in the implementation of uh, legislation once actual impacts to rights existed that uh, the, the legal duty was triggered. So this actually goes back and it's a bit more generous than what the Supreme Court gave us in Nikisu. Um, and then there's the ability to enter into agreements, uh, which we're gonna be talking about today. And there's the action plan, um, which we've had for a little while now. I think we've got about 90 or so sort of calls to action in our provincial action plan. Um, but as mentioned, we're gonna sort of focus on these section six and seven agreements. Section six of DRIPA is effectively wide open. It's an agreement between a nation and the Crown, more or less for any purpose. It, it's just a kind of a catch-all provision. Um, we're not going to talk about that too, too much. Uh, as a, instead, we're going to be talking about section seven. Um, so as you'll recall, we were just talking about in uh, BCEA 2018, section seven there said that no project can proceed where there's a consent-based agreement in place and that nation refuses to provide its consent or withholds its consent. Um, so this is the contemplation of that, or this is an expression of one of those consent agreements. Um, so we have to date one finalized example um, of a consent agreement up in Northern BC, uh, the Taltan nation has finalized their agreement. Um, so maybe we can just go to the next slide. Um, so as mentioned, uh, these are flexible agreements, they're responsive agreements. Um, and from the example that we have right now, TALTAN, which is a project specific agreement, uh, they can cover a lot of the same ground uh, that a collaboration agreement with BCEAO uh, would also entail. But again, the, the big difference there is that consent piece, which says that no project can proceed where this agreement is in place and the nation withholds its consent. So when you look at consent, ultimately being the provincial decision maker with process, with dispute resolution uh, and good faith efforts to negotiate uh, under BCEA 2018 collaboration agreements versus no project may proceed without the consent of a nation per section seven agreements under DRIPA. It's a pretty stark comparison. Um, that said, each instance is gonna be different. Um, and from what I can tell, talking to other practitioners, talking to other nations, there, there still is a political component of section seven agreements. So despite me strongly encouraging nations to take a run at these, to, to look at entering into section seven agreements, there's no guarantee that the crown will actually enter into them. There's no obligation of the crown to enter into a section seven agreement when effectively a nation asks. There's no, there's no trigger, there's no accountability for the crown to do so. It's effectively at its will. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a degree of uncertainty there and, uh, you know, there's only one in the province to date, so we don't really know what that landscape is like. And so that's why we're encouraging so many uh, nations to, to really have these discussions with the Crown and see what the appetite is like to enter into these agreements and to further build out concepts like consent, like consensus seeking, dispute resolution, indigenous legal knowledge, all of those types of things. Um, where we just don't have enough examples of either collaboration agreements or, you know, the one section seven agreement that we have in place. Uh, 
Um, so a lot of the, the list there is pretty similar to what I was talking about with respect to collaboration agreements. Um, in the Taltan context, uh, there was specific assessments that Taltan deemed were so important that it needed to take complete jurisdiction on for itself, um, which is, again, I think a little bit beyond what we've seen in collaboration agreements. And is really cool. It's an expression of inherent jurisdiction. It's an expression of the nation's stewardship obligations uh, and taking accountability for, for uh, making good decisions. Um, again, Indigenous legal orders are always going to be a component or often going to be a component of these types of agreements. How do we revive, uh, breathe life, um, and integrate Indigenous legal orders? into these collaborative processes, um, which is going to serve a lot of purposes, culturally, spiritually, um, socially there, you know, it, it's important to, to make sure to preserve and to reinvigorate Indigenous legal orders. Um, it helps us as practitioners to, to better serve nations, to better understand uh, each specific nation's worldview and perspective. Um, and to be able to give better advice. Um, and then ultimately when some of these things are challenged in court, it's gonna give uh, the Western legal tradition judiciary uh, more to sort of grapple with. And uh, again, it's uh, you know not necessarily a blending, but an incorporation and recognition of these provincial, federal uh, and indigenous legal orders that are all have place in Canada um, and all need recognition, all have a lot of substance and value and complexity. And so uh, again, it's the hard work of engaging in those discussions. Um, burdensome to nations, yes, but also hugely beneficial to you know, this and all future uh, generations as there's gonna be a body of knowledge and uh, resources available there for interpretation and, and better understanding. Um, so, you know, right now, uh, my perspective is Section 7 agreement is kind of the gold standard. It's as good as you can get in terms of giving nations control uh, in the process around how projects are assessed, uh, as well as making that final determination about whether they should proceed or not. Um, but also, sorry to say about these guys. I think that's probably good. There's still... I've heard people talk about uh, uncertainty around when consent is withheld. Um, due to section seven of BCEA 2018. Um, so in the Taltan context, there was a tripartite agreement. It was the Taltan central government, I believe in that instance, uh, BCEAO and the Ministry of Indigenous Reconciliation. Um, so it, the recitals of that, um, agreements explicitly reference section seven and clear as day says the project may not proceed where consent is withheld. Uh, it, there is still language around fettering discretion of the minister um, and ultimately the decision was referred to the minister at the end. My read, and this is not tested at all yet, um, is that that's not a discretionary decision. I think the, the plain language of the act is pretty clear in that instance. Um, but if it's any decision outside of Section 7 of BCEA 2018, I think there's a lot of uncertainty around what happens if consent is withheld. So Section 7 does not explicitly reference natural resources or anything else. It's open to any statutory decision. Um, so it's extremely broad and only BCEA 2018 effectively has contemplated these types of agreements. So one of the, the big areas that is going to have to be addressed in each subsequent Section 7 agreement, particularly if it's not pursuant to Section 7 of BCEA 2018, is going to have to build out what consent looks like, what happens when consent is withheld, um, and also the obligations of the nation. So uh, the Taltan Agreement also explicitly states that the decisions of the Taltan central government are subject to ju judicial review. And we just had another provincial uh, amendment to state that uh, all of these consent-based decisions uh, made by nations are subject to judicial review. So there's a balancing act there. It's not effectively a free-for-all. A nation can make any decision it wants. 
it still has to make uh, a reasonable, fair decision at the end of these processes. Otherwise, it's subject to judicial scrutiny pursuant to judicial review. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of balancing the rights, it, it seems like a pretty reasonable middle of the road approach. Uh, it's not watering down consent. It's just ensuring that the nations are exercising fairness, reasonableness um, in, the, in the, their decision-making around consent. So something else to consider. I think that's it for section seven. We can go to the next slide. And then one of the other things that we're seeing in BC and have been for some time, pre-DRIPA for, uh, you know, for a number of years now, are reconciliation agreements. Um, so these are less procedural. Uh, these are not necessarily related to a specific project or decision. They're not about this is the timeline, the, the steps, the substance of consent, uh, like we were talking about in the last two types of agreements. But really, it's a, about outstanding, significant, outstanding concerns of the nation with respect to decision making, with respect to allocation, with respect to natural resources, um, land historical grievances. Uh, so they're more like a catch-all um, type agreement where it's just an, effectively an open table for the parties to come together, have a, a good open frank discussion around what the scope of the, the rights concerns uh, of the nation are and what the province can reasonably do uh, pursuant to agreement of this type. Um, so I think there's about 20 of these that exist out there in the province right now. Many of them contain significant land transfers. Um, so being in BC, we're in primarily, we don't have historic treaties. We've got Treaty 8 up in the Northeast, um, and we have a number of Douglas treaties, but we're effectively on unceded land. So we don't have a lot of treaty land entitlement claims or things like that. Um, however, lands have been taken up. So in the Quad Gulf example, the airport in Port Hardy was uh, taken away from the nation for war purposes to create an Air Force base. Um, and that's still a, an ongoing issue that's open to discussion. Uh, and so you see a number of issues like that. Um, Sanok for my own nation, as you all may have heard, they're putting up 11 towers at the bottom of Burrard Bridge. Those are contested lands. Uh, my, my nation members, my ancestors were uh, picked up and the village burned and then whatever they were able to take with them was put on a barge and, and floated away. And so despite not having historic treaties for the majority of the province, there's still a significant amount of expropriation and, and wrongful taking up of lands that, that can be addressed through these types of agreements. Sorry, excuse me. Um, let me just go back for one sec. Uh, so despite not being specific process agreements, uh, they, they can set out uh, processes around shared decision-making at, at a bit of a higher level or if a nation has an appetite at a specific level, uh, recognition of that inherent jurisdiction, revenue and uh, resource sharing, and, and protection and recognition of Section 35 rights and titles. So again, moving away from uh, the avoidance, denial to rights recognition. Uh, put uh, Seashell down there, they have a reconciliation agreement, land transfers, uh, recognition of inherent jurisdiction, co-decision making. Um, and uh, we've been seeing more and more of these types of agreements, self-governance agreements, they're sometimes called as well. Um, so really it, it's a suite uh, of agreements under this framework to really be flexible and responsive to what the interests and concerns of the nations are. That maybe they don't have a specific federal or provincial process in place like TLE. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a good way of addressing those and at the same time um, built, getting some of the benefits with respect to rights recognition, inherent jurisdiction recognition. Uh, and making a statement to proponents or anybody else who can do work in the territory that there's agreements in place and that the nation has to be taken seriously. Last slide. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, we talked about all of this stuff. Ultimately, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of 
potential benefit to be had be it by entering into a project specific territorial wide specific either collaboration agreement or section seven agreement um, and if it's uh, more broad not necessarily in relation to a project um, and there's historical grievances or ongoing concerns with respect to how decisions are being made in the territory be it cumulative impacts or uh, sharing of resources or whatever else then reconciliation agreements present a really good opportunity for nations to enter into agreement with the crown uh, and you know, build a lot of leverage with any proponent that's looking to work in the territory that's it Um, so maybe we can just open it up to any questions. And I think I saw one in the chat. So let me see what that is. Consensus defined as lack of persistent and vocal opposition concern. I would say no. I think consensus is a yes or a no effectively. Um, so how we've tracked it in the, the consensus tracking tables is Here's the issue, um, and under the Quagga collaboration agreement, it's not tied to any specific process. There's no limitation. Is that true? No. We have specific consensus seeking at certain points, uh, but a, a general broad concept of working on a consensus basis throughout the entirety of the process. So there's specific triggers under that agreement where formal consensus is required or needs to be tracked and set out. There's the broad principle of consensus seeking. Um, similar with dispute resolution, there's very specific points that it's triggered and can be utilized. Um, and again, this is that balancing about not burdening the process too much, making sure from a procedural standpoint, we're not just burying everybody in obligations that it actually can proceed both for the nation, the crown, and or for the nation, the crown, and the proponent. Um, so to my mind, the speaking of the broad process, um, I think it's a principle. So how are the parties coming together to actually meaningfully understand the concern of the nation and respond to it? Um, so all of those make their way into the consensus tracking table. And at the very end, the, you know, the column with the far right was consensus reach, yes or no, is effectively what we're looking for. So we want that to be very, very clear. So when that document actually makes its way to the final decision maker, the provincial decision maker, they maybe they do read everything in detail, but if they're skimming, uh, the one thing that they're gonna be paying attention to is definitely that column as well, and whether consensus was reached yes or no. Um, and from our perspective, that's uh, the nation's prerogative to, to answer that question. Um, and if there's any pushback from that, then we just include it in the comments, but so far, We've effectively haven't had any issue in terms of the nation being able to make the determination and representation about whether consensus was reached. So it's less of a fight, more of a nuanced understanding of are, are the parties coming together? Is the Crown, in this case the BCEAO, coming to the nation in a meaningful way, sitting down, doing the work to understand the concerns? As we mentioned, it can be socio cultural, historic. All of these other things that the BCAO maybe doesn't necessarily have the expertise or resources or familiarity with uh, from the Indigenous worldview, but are they coming in a meaningful way to understand and then address those concerns? And then ultimately all gets tracked through on that table. So that's how we envision consensus seeking. Uh, uh, a secret ballot, is that uh, uh, your definition of a formal? No, for us, for us, consensus seeking is pretty much out in the open. And so in this context, it's between, it's a government to government thing. So it's between BCEAO and the nation. Um, and in terms of creating this referral package, this ultimate package of documents and the, the EAO and the nation's recommendation about whether a project should proceed or not. Um, so it's not necessarily a ballot or anything. It's the nation coming together in the context of Quagilf, maybe the Quagilf advisory group, the traditional knowledge holders say, you know what, it just doesn't make sense from our Indigenous legal order perspective, from our historical, cultural, whatever, this decision we just we can't give our consent to. And maybe that's the final decision. And the nation says, okay, that's what makes its way into that report. Otherwise, it can be from the technical team. Maybe there's uh, impacts to water or something else that are technical that 
um, the nation is effectively just going to rely on its consultants or, or legal. Um, and so again, it has to be flexible and responsive. Um, it's more difficult and uncertain because you have to approach each individual decision uh, in, a, in a meaningful way and understand it on a case by case basis, as opposed to having a sort of a stricter process where you just say, okay, well, we have the information, let's go vote, we'll come back with our decision. It's more about the, the, the back and forth and shared decision making.